It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to add, I appreciate the um, moment of silence from the uh, Leader of the NDP and our thoughts, uh, hearts are with Jonathan Jenkins' wife, Nancy, and uh, to say to his kids, hopefully they'll see the Hansard someday. I think the highest praise we can give to a journalist who is tough but fair. And every time I talk to Jonathan, there's nothing that dominated his heart uh, than his pride in his son and daughter. He's watching over them. He's damn proud. Speaker. Um, I just want to say it's great to have my deputy leader back in the House today. I'm going to ask one of the pages to bring over a document to the Premier entitled Transit in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area. It was a briefing that the Premier received. I'm going to have time, but I'm going to refer you to page 26 of the document that you were briefed upon. Um, the Finance Ministry officials say that the uh, greatest negative impact on job creation, in fact, it will cost jobs, are payroll tax increases. Again, uh, page 26, I've highlighted it uh, just to call attention to that particular bullet. It's being a son of two teachers that just happens. Um, <laughs> On page 26, uh, Premier, in case that payroll taxes will cost us uh, jobs, do you agree with finance officials that increase in payroll taxes will cost us even more jobs in our province? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to just add my personal condolences to uh, the family and friends and gallery colleagues of Jonathan Jenkins and to. Uh, to wish them uh, all well. This is a very hard and sad time. And I want to welcome uh, uh, Christine Elliott back and uh, to just say that uh, your strength is remarkable and it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you back. <laughs> to my friend opposite <laughs> um, if what he is asking is whether I believe that bringing in a uh, uh, plan that will allow people to save for their retirement and have retirement security when they are uh, ready to go to leave the work world, um, Mr. Speaker, I would suggest that that is absolutely necessary. We have been very, very clear that an enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan would be our first choice, but we believe that it is our obligation to make sure that the people People of Ontario have the ability to have a dignified retirement, Mr. Answer. Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Well, well no, Premier, I believe our, our first obligation is to make sure people have a chance at a well-paying job in our province again. I think that's what our number one thought should be. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in, um, in Brantford uh, recently, and I met with uh, Scott, who is a construction uh, employer. He had uh, Minister nine, Training uh, College uh, Universities come to order. And I asked him, that was in 2003 when the McGinty Wynn government began. And I asked how many employees he has now, and he said none. He, nobody on the payroll except himself. I said, why? He said, there's more red tape. The energy bills have uh, tripled in this province, and payroll taxes mean I can't hire. Uh, the Ministry of Finance officials indicate that for every $2 billion in tax increases on a payroll tax, that will cost us 18,000 jobs. Question. If you do bring in an Ontario registered pension plan, or an ORPP, uh, that is going to be a tax increase that will cost us 150,000 jobs. Thank you. Year. Do you agree with the finance officials? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's question coming from the Leader of the Opposition because we just lowered uh, payroll taxes, the employee health tax, Mr. Speaker. We, we reduced that tax for small businesses, and it was... It was, a, it was a tortured process to get the uh, Leader of the Opposition and his party to acknowledge that that was a, a good thing to do, Mr. Speaker. And I know that what he is talking about is he's talking about uh, retirement security, Mr. Speaker. He's talking about our belief and our proposal that we need to bring forward a plan to make sure that people in this province have the opportunity to retire in security. We would love to have had the support of the uh, Conservatives at the federal level, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we would have loved to have had the support of Stephen Harper, which was called for, Mr. Speaker, by governments Member across the country. We haven't got that, Mr. Speaker, so we are going to move Sir. forward. We will be bringing forward a plan in the budget on Thursday to make sure that people Thank have you. retirement security in this province. 
The member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order second time. Final supplementary. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Well, look, here's the difference between you and me. Um, I want Scott to have the confidence to hire again. I want to see him hire back those nine employees and then more. I want to see them across the province. And that's why we stand solidly behind my million jobs plan to create a million well paying jobs in our province to get people back to work. So let me, if I, um, if I understand this, Premier, you, you, you said that you need to lower pay taxes to create jobs. That's the bill you brought forward that we supported. But now you're saying you're going to increase payroll taxes by $2,500 a person. That means that if Scott wants to hire somebody, he has to pay wages plus $2,500. Wow. And somebody on a payroll will have $2,500 less in their pockets. That's pretty hard to make ends meet today when you can't pay your Hydra bill. Sure. Imagine a $2,500 reduction in your paycheck. So, so which is it, Premier? Do you believe that lowering payroll taxes creates jobs? Or do you believe increasing payroll taxes create jobs? Honest to goodness, Question. you don't like Dolph McGinty. You don't want to have it both ways, do you? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, you know, the Leader of the Opposition knows full well that the document that he passed across the floor had nothing to do with retirement security, Mr. Speaker. It was a discussion on a totally different subject. What we have said is that we believe that there is not enough saving. We know that there is not enough saving that people are capable of, that people are at risk of struggling in their retirement, Mr. Speaker. So we are going to bring forward a plan that will allow people to have that retirement security. But, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition... The opposition talks about uh, creating jobs, Mr. Speaker, but everything he has brought forward would cut jobs, Mr. Speaker. Education jobs, health care jobs. He does not want to partner with business in this province, Mr. Speaker. He is against partnering with Open Text. He's against partnering with Cisco. He's against partnering with food processors. He's against partnering with the auto industry. That opposition would reduce jobs. Question. Leader. Well, back to the, the Premier. No, look, I, I know you gave $120 million to open tax, one of the wealthiest corporations in Ontario. They just gave a big increase to their shareholders. You know, honest to goodness, that's like giving out food vouchers in Rosedale. It doesn't make economic sense. Oh, well, that's right. You already did that after Christmas. I guess in yet you're consistent. But, Premier, back to the topic. These are your own finance official documents. Um, you will recall the briefing, I'm sure. Page 15, interestingly, points out that the worst tax increase to slow down the economy is a business tax increase, which is a hallmark policy of the third party. Your hallmark policy seems to be increasing payroll taxes. Again, on page 26, uh, your own bureaucrats said that a payroll tax increase will lower business investment, will relocate businesses to other jurisdictions, will reduce work effort and will cause an out-migration of people from our province. So what is it exactly that you like so much about tax increases when your bureaucrats say it'll cost us 150,000 more jobs in our Thank province? You. I want to see more jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So um, my understanding of a tax is that it would be money that would go into the provincial treasury, Mr. Speaker. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, second time. The Leader of the Opposition knows full well that that is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is putting in place the capacity for people to save for their retirement. People who are 20 and 30 and 40 right now, Mr. Speaker, are not able to save enough for their futures. That's the reality. And so we believe, as do many leaders across the country, we believe that having an enhancement to the Canada Pension Plan would be a very good thing. Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister, is not interested in doing Answer. that, Mr. Speaker. So it is our obligation to make sure that the people of Ontario have the capacity to save for their future and have a secure retirement, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. There's a, a, a basic um, fundamental of economics that uh, the Liberal Party seems to be ignoring. It's not where the tax goes to it, where it comes from. So if you put a tax on payroll, that means it costs more to hire somebody. And as your finance officials point out, that'll mean 150,000 fewer people working in our province. 
It also means that you come, money comes out of your paid check. That means families will have, on average, $2,500 fewer at the end of the year. So, so that's a tax increase that your own officials say will cost us 150,000 jobs. Order. I want to ask you, Premier, if your plan is putting 150,000 people out of work, if they have no paycheck, how the heck are they going to save for a pension when their income is zero? <laughs> Thank you. I'm not uh, getting things quiet for someone to heckle. Mr. Speaker, well, I, I just have to say that the Leader of the Opposition is simply on the wrong side of this issue. Remember from he, listens to, to order. he listens to people who have worked in the finance. You're testing my resolve. It's working. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West, is warned. You know, Mr. Speaker, we, we, uh, we looked to the federal government to enhance the Canada Pension Plan, and in fact, we know that documents from the Federal Department of Finance demonstrated that an expansion to the Canada Pension Plan would represent meaningful long-term economic order. benefits to the country. So the advice, Mr. Speaker, at the federal level and across the country is that there needs to be more capacity for saving in this country. That's the reality. That's what we're dealing with. David Dodge agrees with that, Mr. Speaker. Finance officials agree with that, Mr. Speaker, but the federal government does not want to act. We are taking that responsibility Thank seriously, you. and we will bring our proposal forward on Thursday. Final Look, uh, we, we know what this is about. I mean, when you started out, you were going to be the social justice premier. That sort of disappeared. Um, then you were going to be the jobs premier, and Lord knows that's out the window with this latest tax graph. You were going to be the transit premier and increase taxes no matter what, and then you backed away from that, so you're looking for something to put in the window. I understand politicians get that way, but I'm concerned that you're putting Minister your of Citizenship and Immigration come to order. the interests of taxpayers. I was talking to a senior citizen in my office the other day who can barely pay her hydro bill. A widow, she's paid off the mortgage, but she can't pay the hydro bill. Workers are facing the same thing. If you're working at a part-time job, if you can't pay the hydro bill, you can't set money aside for retirement. I've got a very different plan. I want to see the middle class create more wealth. I want to see more jobs in our province. That's what I want to see with more take-home pay. You want to subtract from it. I just got to ask you, why in the world Question? should you make a significant $2,500 per person middle class tax hike? Isn't that going to cost us jobs, not create them? Thank you. Premier. Thank the Leader of the Opposition for making my case, because the reality is that that woman who was in his office, he's right. There need to be, needs to be relief, and that's the Minister of Energy has brought in programs to help that woman so that she can get some relief on her energy bill. But, Mr. Speaker, what we know is that if we don't— I'm not going to tolerate people shouting people down. The member from Timmins James Bay will come to order. No, no more. If we don't take action, Mr. Speaker, then people who are in their 30s and 40s now will be in that position because they will not have a decent pension, Mr. Speaker. They will not be able to retire with any kind of security. So what we're doing is we are looking down the road, understanding that people are not able to save enough now, Mr. Speaker, and putting in place a support for them so that they will have a decent Thank retirement. You. That's the long view we're taking. Stop the the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When the Premier was in Windsor last July, she told reporters that she had just found out that girders installed on what she termed as the largest infrastructure project in Ontario did not meet Ontario's safety standards. Does the Premier stand by that statement? Mr. Speaker. 
I will reinforce what I have said repeatedly in this House and what the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure has said. As soon as we knew, Mr. Speaker, that there was a problem with the girders in Windsor, we stopped the building, Mr. Speaker. We did a review. Those girders are being paid, taken out, Mr. Speaker. They have been taken out. We made sure that the safety standards were in place. We took action, Mr. Speaker, and that is exactly what we will do any time there is a safety concern right. with construction in this province. Well, Speaker, according to documents released through FOI, both the offices of the Premier and the Minister knew these girders did not meet safety standards before they were installed. The Minister's office learned about the substandard girders in December of 2012, after which high-level bi-weekly meetings were held to discuss them. Speaker. These meetings included senior staff within the Minister's office, and in April of last year, the Executive Director of Policy in the Premier's office was Minister of Infrastructure, the come to order. Now, is the Premier saying that senior staff in her own office did not tell Minister, her about the public the member from Sudbury, come to order. on what she calls the largest infrastructure project in Ontario's history? Thank you, Premier. No, Mr. Speaker, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the Minister's office staff were first briefed on the safety and durability issues regarding girders on the Herb Gray Parkway on June 14, 2013, and the Minister was briefed on June 19, 2013, Mr. Speaker, and we took action because of our concerns. That's what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, during the Liberal leadership campaign, the Premier boasted that she oversaw the negotiations and the construction of the Windsor Essex Parkway while she served as Minister of Transportation. We know that the Premier's Director of Policy of Training, was being sent to minutes come to order. of the bi-weekly girder meetings as early as April and pro probably even earlier. Does the Premier expect that the people of this province believe her senior, that her senior advisors didn't alert her to a potential scandal surrounding faulty girders being installed in a project that she authorized? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, what I, can, what I can say to the leader of the third party is that we took action, and the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure and I were very clear that as soon as we knew that there was a problem, as soon as we knew that action needed to be taken, we took action, Mr. Speaker. And I don't know if the leader of the third party is making a broader statement that she doesn't support the building of large infrastructure projects. I don't know if the leader of the third party doesn't believe that it's important for us to invest in infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker, but we do believe it is. We believe it's important, and we believe that when there is a problem, you take action, and that's what we did. To see it, please. To see it, please. New question. Leader. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A July 21, 2013 confidential memo to the Premier on the girder issue states, and I quote, there has been some chatter about this situation in Windsor construction circles, and we understand that the Windsor Star may be coming out with a story on this matter this week. It may break during the Premier's visit to Windsor on the July member from Cambridge will come to order. Now, can the Premier tell us why safety issues were ignored until they threatened to disrupt the Premier's campaign to hold a seat in a by-election? Mr. Speaker, I just, you know, <laughs> it is really hard to characterize that question as anything but offensive. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, safety of the people of this province is our number one concern. And yes, we believe that investing in infrastructure projects is very important. But we also believe that when we hear that there is a concern, when Chatham, there is a problem, as soon as there is a problem, that it is our responsibility to make a decision and take action. That is what we did, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, we brought the and MPP Lee's from T Windsor Tecumseh and into Lee's the Lee's process. Lee's we briefed him. He, we kept his party and her party informed. She knows that, Mr. Speaker.
Speaker. She knows he was part of the process, and she knows yes, that we took action. Speaker, what is offensive is the Liberals putting their own political well-being ahead of the person. Wrap up, please. We know that from correspondent speaker that this government knew the girders on the parkway were faulty and didn't act on these public safety concerns for seven months. Had the Winter Star not been investigating these girders, would these unsafe girders continue to quietly be installed on the very par parts of the parkway to this very day? Thank speaker? you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister Speaker, I want to be very clear about this, as I was yesterday. And I am deeply offended by the leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker. Ridiculous. Uh, that'll do. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs is not helpful in the conversation. And nor is the member from Lanark. And when I sit down, if somebody else starts up, I'll nail you. Finish, please. I, I hope the leader of the third party will take the time to correct her own record. She wasn't I'm going to read, she Mr. Wasn't Speaker, into the record very carefully and very slowly the report of both ministries, infrastructure in Ontario. The minister's office staff were first briefed on the safety and durability issues regarding girders on the Herb Gray Parkway on June 14, 2013, and the minister was briefed on June 19, 2013. And, Mr. Speaker, the reason I was briefed is because in May, when I, under instructions from the Premier, was asked to thoroughly review each Answer. infrastructure project, I was advised there were concerns. The first week of June, I went to both deputy ministers. Both deputy ministers said they were not aware Thank of you. any safety concerns, Thank and they you. undertook a review right now. Thank you. Final supplementary. When she was the Minister of Transportation, the Premier awarded the project agreement for the Windsor-Essex Parkway. She bragged about it during the Liberal leadership race. But Documents that we've obtained show that engineers at the Ministry of Transportation were raising concerns about poor quality of construction and serious deficiencies of this project. Now, what does the Premier have to say, Speaker, to the people of Windsor and the people of Ontario, frankly, when they see that she was prepared to put political expediency ahead of public safety? Thank you, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, when the Premier was the Minister of Transportation, no one in senior management, nor was there any information or knowledge there was a problem. When I became Minister, I heard concerns and rumours. Every minister hears rumours and concerns. I validated those, and it was not until this government ordered full destructive trusting of two sets of tests that we discovered in late August there was a safety issue as a result. My question, Mr. Speaker, is where was the opposition? The member for T Windsor West raised this issue. All your Windsor members were silent, and Mr. Speaker, I hope the leader of the third party will rise and apologize for the inaccurate information she's putting on the record, Mr. Speaker. Please. 
Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Simcoe Group. My question is uh, to the Premier. Premier, I want to begin by complimenting you on your dedication to fitness. A few months ago, you ran television ads telling Ontarians how much you love to run. It's obviously an important part of your life. Now try to imagine, what if you couldn't run? What if you couldn't breathe? What if your lungs were constantly filled with mucus? What if you could never run again? How would that make you feel? Maddie Vanstone, a 12-year-old girl with cystic fibrosis, started out not being able to run, barely being able to walk. Now, thanks to the new drug, she can run. She can run like you, and she loves it. She loves being able to do something as simple as being able to run. But how much longer will she be able to run? The money Maddie's family and friends have fundraised is quickly depleting. In fact, right now, her dad's insurance company that covers half the cost of the drug is reassessing his claim. Question. Premier, help Maddie run. Or better yet, run with Maddie. When will you fund the drug collider? Can you say it, please? Please. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will want to uh, um, give an update on, on the situation, but I know that the member opposite knows that uh, I met with Maddie and her mom. I don't know if they're in the, in the house, but uh, there they are. Um, and I, uh, I know that the member opposite also knows that uh, there is a, a national process that we are pushing very hard, Mr. Speaker. When, we met with, uh, when I met with my colleagues from across the country a few weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, we made it clear that this is not, this is not an issue just for Maddie, that there are other other children and other people in other parts of the country, Mr. Speaker, who need this drug to be covered, and we need that deal, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we are pushing very hard. And I, uh, I will ask the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And there's Thank you, plan. supplementary. Premier, you and your health minister continue to tell us that you have to be cognizant of all taxpayers, that you are waiting to get the best value for the drug Kalydeco. That's your excuse. But when it came to the gas plant scandal, instead of waiting for the best deal by cancelling the Oakville plant after the election, you spent $1.1 billion of taxpayers' money to save a couple of your colleagues' seats. The sky is the limit to save your own political skins, but $300,000 for a life-saving medication for a young girl has to go through years of negotiations. It's wrong. And now, ahead of a possible spring election, we see in a leaked budget documents that you are set to spend another $6 billion on various new spending projects while children like Maddie suffer. It's absolute nonsense. It's been 15 months. Maddie and her mom are here today. This is a child a human Question. life. People are dying waiting for orphan drugs to be approved by your government. When will you do the right thing and fund this? Premier. Health and long-term care. Minister of Health and long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and I too uh, welcome Maddie and her mom to uh, to the legislature today. And as you know, Speaker, we uh, we have committed to keeping the family informed of the negotiations. This was an issue that came up when health ministers from across the country gathered. And, uh, in fact, we collectively agreed to do something we've never done before, and that is we have asked to sit down with the manufacturer to find resolution to this issue. Children like Maddie do need access to the drug. We want this drug uh, to be listed, Speaker, but we need to insist that the pan-Canadian process works. We have successfully negotiated over 30 listings, Speaker, saving us over $50 million. We must continue to work with the manufacturer, Vertex Speaker, a U.S.-based company. We must, they must um, work with us so that we can fund Thank this you. drug for people like Maddie. No question. Member, the member from Windsor to come My question to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Speaker, senior ministry engineers are concerned that because of the design-build model on the Herb Gray Parkway, Structures won't last even half the lifespan outlined in the project agreement. Senior MTO engineer Joey Chirico says that under the AFP model authorized by Premier Wynne, MTO has little to no oversight and that he is, and I quote, certain nothing will be done by the construction companies to fix the deficiencies identified by the MTO. Speaker. Why did the Premier authorize a contract that cut the lifespan of the project, compromised public safety, and put the public on the hook for costs 
associated with the delays. Mr. Speaker, I just will be very clear. Everything that was just said is, in fact, not accurate, to say the least. The project is up to the highest safety standards in Ontario, which has the highest roads and bridge standards in North America, at the highest safety levels. The, the, the members opposite are not literate about the basics of this. They do not understand the difference between a discussion about compliance and compliance Member Mr. From Speaker, Durham, come to order. means everything from grass seed to the color of a post. So when you see discussions about compliance, they are usually minor issues. The safety standards by the chief engineer and the deputy minister and independent experts, now three engineering companies, this is the highest standard of safety. Any Answer. faulty girder has been removed, and because of the AFP process, the company, not the taxpayers, are paying for it. And you're opposed to that. You. You'd rather have the taxpayers pay for it. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Speaker, it's not all about the girders. Lots of other stuff going on there. <laughs> Senior ministry engineers are saying the Herb Gray Parkway may not even last half of the layout, half of the lifespan outlined in the project agreement that Premier Wynne authorized. We may have already lost more than half the value of the $1.4 billion project, and it hasn't been completed. The Premier authorized the project agreement that stripped away the government's ability to deal immediately with ongoing structural deficiencies. Will the Premier take responsibility for the Herb Gray Parkway project and come clean with the full liability to Ontario taxpayers? Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member for Windsor West has already been there, done that a year ago. She raised this issue, and we acted. The NDP has more people, members now in that area than we do. And if they had, if they had one more, this would have been a problem because it was only the member for Windsor West. You guys are on the bench asleep, Mr. Speaker. And. Let me just read into the record, Mr. Uh, the member for Windsor to Compass, etc. Taxpayers will be on the hook for eight months of construction costs, and th that is not true. That is not true. Taxpayers are not on the hook for anything. So here, the member is sending out communications that I believe, Mr. Speaker, he knows, he knows are different than what the facts are. So I would again, because I thought I had with Mr. Good Morning a collegial relationship, but it appears that he's very prepared to say one thing in this house and another thing out there, and there's a distraction here because what you're saying out there bears no relationship to the facts, my friend. Thank you. Question, the member from Scarborough, Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Speaker, I'm incredibly proud that our government has demonstrated our commitment to helping young people find meaningful employment through our youth job strategy. I know this strategy was developed after a series of consultations which brought together business leaders, employers, not-for-profits, educators, labour and, of course, the young people themselves. This local perspective directly influenced how our government designed our larger strategy. I know we've had recent announcements on the success of these programs, especially in my riding. Stop the clock. We could all use a little bit of respect around here. Please finish your question. Thank you, Speaker. I know we've had recent announcements on the success of these programs, especially in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, which has a significant young population in communities like question. Kingston Galloway, Orton Park, and Murnau Court. With the speaker, through you, Speaker, would the Minister please update this House on recent developments of our youth Thank employment you. strategy? Minister, Minister, uh, <laughs> you got it. Environment. Economic development, trade and employment. Trade and, uh, trade and employment. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this uh, $295 million investment that was announced in last year's budget is uh, paying real dividends for youth right across this province. We're very proud of the success that we've seen so far. And I'm going to give a couple of examples of just how we're making a difference in getting employment, helping young people get employment in Ontario. At George Brown College here in Toronto, they're working, uh, providing skills training in commercial baking as well as sheet metal construction 
for youth here in the GTA who are facing multiple barriers to uh, employment. And I was recently in Windsor as well, meeting with and making an announcement at the Downtown Windsor Business Accelerator, where that organization, a great uh, uh, initiative in Downtown Windsor, is mentoring and supporting young entrepreneurs from the Windsor-Essex uh, region of the province. And then lastly, Mr. Speaker, Operation Come Home, I had the honour, together with the uh, member from Ottawa Centre just a couple of weeks ago, to uh, visit that facility right downtown Ottawa, which is doing amazing work, Mr. Speaker, with formerly homeless young persons, quite frankly, helping them start businesses, and successful businesses, changing their lives around for their betterment and their for, for the betterment of their colleagues. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his answer. My constituents will be happy to hear that the youth job strategy is being fully implemented. As a member from Scarborough, I know our sizable youth population appreciates the opportunities that we've created to help them get a good start. So many organizations like Impact for Communities and East Scarborough Storefront are working tirelessly on this issue, and I understand the importance of partnering with industry to ensure that we train and provide opportunities for youth not only for the jobs of today, but to help them with their future careers. And I know this specifically, having held a youth job strategy forum, as well as a business breakfast to engage local employers. Our Youth Employment Fund is a key part of these initiatives. Speaker, can the minister give us an update on what the Youth Employment Fund is doing Question. towards our government's goal of creating good jobs for young people and growing our economy? I apologize to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister. To the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. <laughs> Mr. Training Colleges and Universities. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Aaron Speaker. Uh, building a strong economy and creating job opportunities for youth is a priority for our Premier. It's a priority for this government. In fact, it's one of our top priorities. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to be able to say that our Youth Employment Fund has been an extraordinary success. Since its launch in September, this fund has already helped 11,526 oh, wow. wow. young people find uh, job experience right in the workplace. Amazing. The fund has also had a particular focus on youth furthest from the labour market, and I think that's what makes it such a success. It focuses on Aboriginal youth, youth with disabilities, rural and northern youth, youth leaving care, as well as youth right across this province, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud also to be able to share with members that 84 per cent of young people that have completed their placement through the Youth Employment Fund have landed employment. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if it's going to stay that high as this program continues, but Mr. Speaker, it's off to a fantastic fantastic start. No We're really proud of it. We're giving young people that opportunity in the workplace that they need to help us build a stronger that economy. Thank you. Your question, the member from the PN Thank you very much. Uh, speaker, my question is uh, to the Premier. Uh, she boasts of her government's openness, yet it is her Liberal Party that has been accused by the, by the OPP of destroying uh, documents as related to the gas plant scandal. And it is she who is attempting to silence myself and the leader of the official opposition with a lawsuit. And this morning, the Minister of Transportation threatened threatened a lawsuit against the member from Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke. In November of 2012, the Freedom of Information request for all gas plant-related uh, documents in the Premier's office turned up just 100 pages. Then on the day that she was sworn in as Premier, that FOI was trimmed down to 88 pages by April 20, uh, 13, and uh, an FOI appeal said it, would be, it was discovered that emails had been deleted and recovering them would be impossible. Given that timeline, it's clear that the Premier's commitment to so-called open government Question. was made with the knowledge that several senior Liberals have been deleting emails because her government would have had to research that and search them. Will she Thank tell you. us why it took an OPP investigation? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You see me, please? You see me, please? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, um, I believe at the at the moment we have provided 391,707 wow. pages of documents to uh, the committee, including 30,000 from the Premier's office. The Premier herself has appeared in front of committee, uh, as has the Minister of Energy. I've appeared. The Minister of Transportation has appeared. Mr. Speaker, we've made ourselves available to answer questions that have been put forward by the opposition. I can't say the same thing about opposition candidates. And at the same time, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, cooperated fully with them and uh, will continue to cooperate fully. The issue of uh, the deletion of documents, Mr. Speaker, the member is well aware, is the subject right now of an OPP investigation, shredded, and I think we should answer. allow the OPP to undertake their work. Thank you, supplementary. Premier announced that she was going to uh, 
go through uh, with a project called Open Government. She actually spelt government wrong and forgot the end. But I'm going to propose today that we actually change this initiative to Open Government yes. and put a C in there, Speaker, because this government's record. That's not acceptable. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Her record on openness is spotty. She told this House the cancel gas plants only cost $40 million. When she signed the contract, she would have known the truth. She held a caucus meeting as Liberal leader and as Premier on January 30th, yet she now tries to tell us she wasn't Premier at all. She was Premier while one of her staff had her hard drive wiped by Peter Feist, who, by the way, Peter Feist was still a member of her staff until a month ago. Surely the Premier knows that things from the public is going to go short, badly wrong for her because we will uncover the truth. So will she be open Thank and honest you. today with this caucus? Thank you. 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 The uh, minister without portfolio come to order. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the honourable member has some gall to talk about truth and facts. Let's get the facts on the record, Mr. Speaker, if I can. Not my finest yeah, moment, Mr. Speaker. Let's get the facts on the member. On May 7th last year, the Justice Committee asked for all gas plant documents in the Take Premier's office. On May 21st, the Premier's office delivered 30,000 documents. 30, and here is what the letter from the Chief of Staff said, quote, I am writing on behalf of the Office of the Premier in response to the motion passed by the Standing Committee on Justice Policy on May 7th and May 9th. We were advised by Cabinet Office IT that the email accounts of 52 individuals formerly employed in the Premier's office could be accessed. A search of those accounts was conducted by my office and any available records applicable to the committee's motion have been included. I have enclosed with this letter a list of the 52 individuals. Mr. Speaker, as a member of the committee, she would have received that letter, Mr. Speaker. What she is doing today, Mr. Speaker, is, is beneath her in standing up and, and spreading no, this thank mischievous. You. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. I hope you're having a good morning today. <laughs> Premier, yesterday, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure claimed repeatedly that the safety of the girders was never discussed with the Minister's office before he raised the issue in June. However, I'm holding the agendas of 12 weekly and bi-weekly update meetings for the Minister's office on the Herb Gray Parkway. Each of the meetings from the 14th of December to the 7th of June took place six months before the minister claimed he knew. Each meeting references girders and their lack of CSA certification, certification meant to protect public safety. Does the Premier stand by their statements that are minister? Question. Thank you, Premier. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. I could have tried. I'm not lying for not what. I'll say it once again. It is very clear there are meetings every two weeks. The topic of the girders is discussed every single time, but it is not a question. Many bi-weekly meetings where girders were discussed. Never was there a discussion of safety. Now, I am not lying. I am telling you the truth. The chief engineer is not lying. Not, the deputy minister is not lying. The assistant deputy minister is not lying. The frontline safety officers are not lying. The independent engineering firms yes, are not lying. And for what the members have said to be true, all those people would have to be lying, Mr. Speaker. So maybe he's Thank wrong. Supplementary. Read the documents. Yesterday, Speaker, the minister denied his deputy ministers knew anything about safety issues on the Herb Gray Parkway. The minister said, and I quote, the first week of June, I went to both of my deputy ministers and asked them if they knew anything. They both said clearly they were not aware of any particular safety concerns. Speaker, according to government documents, the minister's deputy minister was regularly updated on the public safety concerns of the girders in 12 update meetings and received briefings in their own monthly update meetings 
on January the 15th, the 8th of February, the 8th of March, and the 12th of April. Is the Premier going to stand by while her minister denies what's in front of us in black and white? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will try again. It would scare me, Mr. Speaker, if these people were ever near power. Because let me tell you what some of the compliance issues that are outstanding right now. One of them is the shrubs, Mr. Speaker. We have a whole group working on to make sure that we have the right kind of shrubs that won't die six months. That's a compliance issue, Mr. Speaker. The design of a wall and the shape of the wall is a compliance issue. They are not synonymous with safety issues, Mr. Speaker. There are several projects that could have 100 or 200 compliance issues, of which a junior member of my staff may be briefed on. The safety issue, Mr. Speaker, until August. Now, we're going all the way to August. I raise this. It gets dealt with. Independent testing, twice. The first round of independent testing done by the project company in late July, early August Answer. came back with no safety concerns. I was not satisfied. The Premier was not satisfied. I ordered a second round of testing, six girders. One came out faulty. Thank you. That Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa or Leeds. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, energy policy about a hot topic in Ontario. It's an issue that affects every Ontarian directly. In fact, one of the calls I get from my own constituency in Ottawa or Leeds is about their electricity bills, what they can do to lower them. We have just experienced one of the coldest winters in almost a century. Conservation is the best way to reduce energy costs. I attended the minister's announcement in Ottawa at the Jai Tiger last Friday, where the success of conservation was highlighted. Residents know that the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, which the opposition voted against, is set to expire at the end of 2015. I know my constituents are wondering what the government will do to help them with, when with their bills when the benefits wind down. Minister, can you please tell the House about the details of the announcement you made last week Question. regarding how our government will be helping people with their electricity bills? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Can I thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for the question. Uh, speaker, the previous government allowed the old Ontario Hydro to accumulate tens of billions of dollars of debt, Shame forcing them to take drastic action. This included adding the debt retirement charge, DRC, onto electricity bills. Yeah. Speaker, to help ease pressure on residential rates, our government announced last week that we will remove the DRC two years earlier than originally projected. Eliminating the DRC would save a typical residential electricity ratepayer about $70 a year. In addition, we also announced that we will provide a bill reduction for low and modest income consumers. Mr. Speaker, Answer. together with the elimination of the DRC, this program will give a benefit of $250 each year for eligible consumers. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. It's certainly great news for families across Ontario. I know my office receives a lot of questions about debt retirement charge. People wonder why that charge is on their bills. Who put it there? And until last week, when will it be coming off? I can understand where they are coming from. I know that the charge was created by the PC government when they were last in power, and that ratepayers have been paying it ever since. But given some of the confusion that seems to exist around the portion of the consumer's energy bills, I think it would be helpful for the minister to explain to the House the origin of this charge and why we are still paying it. Can the minister please explain the history of the debt retirement charge and where the money that All is right. collected goes? Tell the truth. Thank you. Minister. The debt retirement charge is a direct result of the mismanagement of the old Ontario Hydro under the Hudak Harris PC government. And also, when we took over government, we inherited a system that was not clean, was not reliable, and was not affordable. So we invested $31 billion to repair the damage. I guess that's not good enough. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. And the member from Durham come to order a second time. Finish, please. Speaker, they don't like to hear the truth. So we invested $31 billion to repair the damage, and we also took the opportunity to eliminate coal-fired generation, which yeah. is taking the equivalent of 7 million cars off Ontario roads. In addition to removing the DRC, we previously Answer. introduced a 10% discount on bills and implemented a number of tax the member from Stormont, Dundas, and measures. South Glengarry will come and to In order. contrast to the PC bungling, our government has consistently reduced the stranded debt Answer. by over $8 billion since 2004. 
Speaker, I urge the opposition to help Ontario ratepayers save money by Thank supporting you. our budget. And finally, New taking question. the legacy costs. Thank you. New question. The member from Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Premier. Premier, why did the government deliberately and heartlessly, heartlessly sacrifice the horse racing industry in favour of a pie-in-the-sky scheme to build glittering casinos in Toronto, the Premier's backyard? Here, here. Here, here. So, Mr. Speaker, I know that the uh, I know that the member opposite is uh, is very supportive of a plan for the horse racing industry that would see it be sustainable over time, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, into the future, and that's exactly what we have put in place. I came into this job, Mr. Speaker. I knew. I knew that there were concerns with the changes that were being made in the horse racing industry. The former Minister of Agriculture and Food uh, had, had made it clear that there needed to be changes made, Mr. Speaker, that the, the removal of the, the non-transparent and uh, uh, really not um, accountable uh, slots at racetrack program, Mr. Speaker, that it needed to be changed, but that there needed to be a sober second thought on what the replacement would be, Mr. Speaker. That's why the panel was struck. That's why we took rec their recommendations, Mr. Speaker. That's why there's $500 million over the next five years in the horse racing industry to make sure that they have a sustainable future. I'm proud of the work that we've done, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to make sure that horse racing in Ontario yes, is sustainable and accountable. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Unfortunately, her plan is not working. Yep. Speaker, those glittering casinos were never even built, and yet the horse racing uh, industry now lies in ruins. Done. The Auditor General's report yesterday confirmed what we have said all along. The Liberal NDP move to terminate SARP was done with no consultation or consideration of the enormous damage it would do to people in the industry. The government had the information to know that their decision would mean fewer race states, less breeding, less employment, and fewer economic benefits to the agriculture industry. Because the government ignored that information, we now have racetracks closed, lawsuits against the province, and thousands of jobs destroyed. Does that even bother the Premier? Nope. Because that, Speaker, is her record. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Premier? The government has stabilized the horse racing industry. We have put in place a plan that will allow the horse racing industry to move forward, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, the Auditor General, the Auditor General was not complimentary of the slots at racetrack program, Mr. Speaker. What she said was, Owners grew reliant on their growing slots revenue share just to sustain their horse racing operations, and they submitted requests to the ORC for fewer race days per year, Mr. Speaker. So, the SARP program was not working. I acknowledged, Mr. Speaker, during our leadership, though, that the uh, replacement for the SARP program was inadequate. We made the changes when I came into this office, Mr. Speaker, and now there is a path to sustainability. The $500 million that we are putting in place because of the recommendations the of John Snowden and John Wilkinson and Answer. Elmer Buchanan, Mr. Speaker, will allow the horse racing industry to be sustainable into the future. Thank you. No question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Your minister stated there will be no additional cost to the government as a result of the girder replacement on the $1.4 billion per Gray Parkway. Your government correspondence says there may, in fact, be substantial cost bill to the government by the project company as a result of the delays in construction. Can the Premier tell us how much is your government's failure to act on public safety going to cost Ontarians? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Transportation will want to speak to the details, but what we, what we uh, need to make clear, Mr. Speaker, is that the costs for replacing the girders are being borne by the company, Mr. Speaker. They are not being borne by the taxpayers of Ontario, and that's because, that's because of the agreement that was in place. That's because of the contract that was in place, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, Mr. Speaker, I, and I, I know that the Minister will speak to the details, but I really think it's interesting that the member opposite is not standing in his place and talking about the investment that was announced yesterday in the Ring of Fire, Mr. Speaker, for infrastructure in the north. I would have thought that the member from Tim and James Bay would have thought that that was a very good investment, Mr. Speaker, and he's silent on it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Get it, please. Supplementary. The minister claims there will be no cost to the public associated with the girder replacement. And construction, these construction delivery. Stop the clock. May a member of the Minister of Energy come to order, please? Start the clock. Order, please. Carry on. You know, the Premier claims that there will be no cost associated to the public with girder replacement and construction delay. This reminds me of the gas plant scandals. Yep. When news was breaking that the government claimed there were no costs associated to the cancellation, the cost ballooned over a billion dollars. The Herb Way Parkway is already costing the public $1.4 billion. When is the Premier going to tell the people of this province what they will be paying for her failure on the largest infrastructure project in Ontario's history? Transportation and infrastructure. So, Mr. Infrastructure. Speaker, the $1.4 billion is a critical investment in the lives of the people of Windsor. It was an investment that former members Pupatello and Duncan and my friend from Windsor West promised and they delivered. Done, done, done. It forced the federal government and the American government to build the presidential bridge. This will create thousands of jobs and boost the Windsor economy. Because of your ideological rigidness, you can't support AFP. If this project had been done on the terms the only way the NDP could do it, it that cost would have gone to the taxpayers. It was because of this government's policy in the AFP model that the cost is to the project. The deal is done. The contracts are signed. There's no residual liability. When will that member and that party stand up for Windsor? When are they going to start demanding the federal New question, the member from Matoko North. Merci, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Matthews, for a moment, Speaker, I too. Speaker, can't hear myself. <laughs> I, uh, the member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to order. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, second time. And the Minister responsible for seniors hiding behind his hand again. The member for Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry, second time. Finish, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I too would like to respectfully acknowledge the courage and resilience of the members of Whitby, Oshawa, the former federal and current provincial. Minister, even way back when in med school, when we were studying introdermatology, we were alerted to skin cancer risks caused by ultraviolet radi radiation. And knowing these risks of DNA damage, I am concerned about the use and abuse of tanning beds. As we're approaching the end of the school year, I know that many young people in my own riding of Etobicoke North are thinking about one thing, the end of year school prom. And that's why many young people feel a pressure to look a certain way. We know, for example, from the World Health Organization that use of tanning beds under the age of 35 increases skin cancer risk by 75%. Thank you. What are we doing to protect Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And thank you to the member from Etobicoke North. As the member has stated, the risk of tanning bed by young people are very clear, yet more and more young Ontarians have been using tanning beds. In fact, we've seen a doubling of the use for grade 11 and 12 uh, students. At the same time, the incidence of melanoma in Ontario has been rising for young people, 
and that's why we took action. In October 2013, we passed legislation to prohibit young people from using tanning beds in Ontario. I'm very pleased that that restriction comes into effect tomorrow. Tanning bed operators will need to post signs about this restriction and about the dangers of tanning bed use for everyone. Operators will need to ask for ID from anyone who appears to be under the age of 25, and they'll be banned Answer. from marketing their services to youth under 18. This action will save lives, and that's how this year's prom season will be different. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. I know that many parents in Etobicoke North, of course, and across the province will be pleased with the action our government is taking to protect young people from cancer. But since cancer, Speaker, as you'll appreciate, is a multifactorial disease, we know that tanning bed use is only one of the many activities that increase cancer risk. Unfortunately, there are many other forms of cancer, which is in fact best thought of as a family of diseases, not a single condition. As an MD, I know that Ontario's cancer system is top-notch and that a person diagnosed with cancer in our province has one of the best chances of survival in the world. But as always, Speaker, prevention is better than cure, and there's of course more that we should do to stop people from putting themselves in harm's way. Minister, would you be able to please inform the, this House what is the government doing in Question. other domains, in other cancer areas, uh, to protect our kids? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term well, Thank care. you, Speaker. And I got ahead of myself. The ban comes into effect on Thursday, May the 1st. Uh, so other things we've done, we've introduced a free vaccine to protect young women against uh, HPV, which is the major, major cause of cervical cancer. We're working hard to protect our kids from the harmful effects of tobacco smoke. We've already banned smoking in enclosed public spaces and motor vehicles when children under 16 are present. Now we're taking the next step with proposed legislation and regulations that would, if passed, increase fines for those who sell tobacco to kids, making them the highest in the country. It would ban flavored tobacco products, prohibit the sale of tobacco products in schools and childcare facilities, and prohibit smoking on and around playgrounds, sports fields, and restaurant patios. And I'm calling on all members of all parties to support this bill. It's what we need to protect our kids. Answer. New question, the member from Leeds, Randall. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier and his capacity as Minister of Agriculture. Last month, uh, Premier, you were missing in action when a century of excellence in agriculture education was put in jeopardy when the, the Kempville College closure announcement. Last week again, Minister, you were missing in action again. It was your ministry that committed uh, $2 million to the University of Guelph to reinstate some skilled trades programs but failed to do your job in adding those core agriculture uh, courses. The ag community was very clear. Any program that didn't include ag was unacceptable. And, and the agriculture community further wants to remind you that Kempel College isn't a trade school, it's an agricultural college. Yep. When are you going to stand up as a minister and stand up for farmers and farm families for agriculture education? Minister of Agriculture. Speaker, you know, uh, the, uh, the member opposite knows full well that uh, as soon as we knew of this situation, both with Alfred College and with Kempville, um, my parliamentary assistant, the, uh, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell, was on the job, Mr. Speaker, and was making sure that we found solutions. And we did find solutions, Mr. Speaker. We found solutions with funds attached to those solutions, Mr. Speaker. So I have been very much engaged in making sure that we work with the University of Guelph, that we work with the colleges, that we work with the community to make sure that a solution was put in place. If the member opposite is suggesting that I shouldn't have gone and visited the people in the Belleville area, Mr. Speaker, who were uh, struggling with their, uh, with their flooding issues, if, if the member opposite— It's with regret. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is named. First Agriculture Minister. You don't give us your hands over there. Thank you. Order, please. Please finish.
but just to say, Mr. Speaker, that it was uh, it was very important to me that we find a solution on the Kempfield programs. It was also very important to me, Mr. Speaker, that I was able to meet with people in the Belleville the area. Member from as the and will come to order. Thank you. New question. Uh, sorry, complimentary. Premier, Premier, the farmers and farm families across Ontario know one thing, and they know one thing that it's you, Minister, that aren't doing your job on this farm. Well, Minister, let me contrast what a Tim Hudak Ontario PC government would do for Ontario. We'd make private sector job creation a priority and grow agri-food and agriculture sectors by supporting the education programs they need to stay competitive. Support. Under a Tim Hudak government, the University of Guelph would get Minister the same the answer they got order, from previous PC agriculture ministers who wanted to close these campuses. The answer we give them was no. Students in those ag diploma programs Question. who can't begin their education in Kempville this year because you said yes. When are you going to stand up for agriculture education in Eastern Ontario? Stand up for those students. Thank you. The member from Halton come to order. Finish, please. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I, um, you know, I understand why the member opposite and uh, that party believe that it is in the interests of their. Uh, their party to drive wedges between groups of people in Ontario, to drive wedges between rural Ontario and urban Ontario, Mr. Speaker, to drive wedges between people who work on the farm and people who work in urban centres. I don't believe that, Mr. Speaker. I don't believe that it's in the best interest of the province's future for those kinds of wedges to be exacerbated, Mr. Speaker. But that is the politics of division that they practice. We made an announcement last week, Mr. Speaker. Actually, it was this week on food processing. Over 60 food processors, Mr. Speaker, over 60 yeah. groups that are getting local Answer. food funding, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. That group called that corporate welfare, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. They're wrong on that, and they're wrong on the support for Order, please. On April the 28th, 2014, the member from Nipissing, Mr. Fidelli, submitted a notice of his intention to raise a point of privilege. The notice alleges that there has been contempt of the legislature on the basis that various members of the House made deliberately misleading statements on budget-related forecasts. Having had an opportunity to review various procedural authorities, including previous rulings by speakers of this House, I am now prepared to rule on the matter without hearing further from the member, as Standing Order 21D permits me to do. The notice indicates that the Cabinet was informed on February 13, 2013, through a slide deck, that a projected deficit figure for fiscal 2009-2010 in the 2009 public government document had been more of a worst-case figure than a realistic figure, and that the subsequent 2013 budget reiterated this figure. The notice makes a second allegation, namely that the various cabinet ministers made statements in the House that the government was on track to balance the budget by 2017-2018, despite the cabinet being informed on February 13, 2013, through the same slide deck that no plan was in place to achieve this objective and that the fiscal outlook beyond fiscal 2013-2014 was deteriorating. I first want to address serious questions as to the timelines, the timeliness of the member's point of privilege. It has been many weeks, if not months, since the Standing Committee on Estimates received the financial documents that form the basis of the argument made in the notice. This points to a lack of the timelessness, timeliness in submitting the notice. However, I am reluctant to dismiss the member's point of privilege solely on the basis of timeliness and therefore will address it as follows. The notice refers to the so-called Begee test for the determining whether a statement of, by a member is deliberately mislead, is misled the House. Pages 653 and 654 of the third edition of McGee's parliamentary practice in New Zealand identifies what needs to be established for the Speaker to find a prima facie case of contempt 
based on a member deliberately misleading the House as follows. There are three elements to be established when it is alleged that a member is in contempt by reason of a statement that the member has made. The statement must, in fact, have been misleading. It must be established that the member making the statement knew at the time that the statement was made that it was incorrect, and in making it, the member must have intended to mislead the House. As Speaker Carr indicated in, in a ruling in this House, page, uh, page 102 of journals for the June 17, 2002, the threshold for finding a prima facie case of contempt against a member of the Legislature on the basis of deliberately misleading the House is therefore set quite high and is very uncommon. It must involve a proved finding of an overt attempt to intentionally mislead the Legislature. In the absence of an admission from the member accused of the conduct or of a tangible confirmation of the conduct independently proved, a Speaker must assume that no honourable members would engage in such behaviour or that, at most, inconsistent statements were the result of inadvertence or an honest mistake. In the case at hand, I make the following observations about the application of, of the McGee test and Speaker Carr's ruling. With respect to the McGee test, the repetition of the worst-case financial figure used in the government document and the supposed absence of a plan to achieve a fiscal objective is not evident of a false, falsity of the figure or of the objective. Moreover, the respect of the allegation that the government led people to believe that it had a plan to achieve a stated fiscal objective, the quoted statements made by the ministers in 2013 refer only to being on track towards the fiscal objective not to the plan to achieve it. Even if they had, I note that the slide deck itself refers to the plan to balance, relying on expenditure restraints and revenue-raising measures. The side deck is far removed from pointing to a member knowingly and intentionally making a misleading statement. It does not attempt to, in Speaker Carr's words, an admission of the member accused of the conduct or a tangible confirmation of the conduct independently proved. The commentary in the slide deck is not in the same ballpark as the member making two completely irreconcilable statements in the House and then conceding that he or she had done so knowingly and intentionally. Finally, it is not the role of the Speaker to assess the rationale for the use of worst-case figures in a financial document, let alone determine whether the figure amounts to misinformation. The evidence of that criteria in the McGee test have been, satisf uh, have been satisfied is at very best speculative. For these reasons, I find that a prima facie case of contempt has not been established, and I thank the member from Nivising for his notice. We have a deferred vote on the motion from third reading of Bill 21, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act 2000 in respect to family caregiver, critically ill child care, and crime-related child death or disappearance leaves of absence. In the, uh, call in the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
All members take their seats, please. All members take their seats, please. Thank you. Mr. Nackney has moved to third reading of Bill 21. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Peruzzi. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Zellia. Mr. Zellia. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denovo. Ms. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Being recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 91, the nays are zero. The ayes being 91 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Bill Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.